Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the latest ISC podcast. And sorry, not podcast, it's a webinar, isn't it? <laughs> We're doing so much content at the moment, I'm confusing myself. Um, today's webinar is um, uh, about attraction and marketing. Um, it's a subject that over, over the last um, over the last week or two, we found that people have been starting to turn their attention to as the coronavirus, coronavirus um, you know, um, continues. People are starting to think actually around, you know, those that are still recruiting, those that want to you know, protect their brands, um, people start to think about what, how they can either do that now or what might be different to come the autumn. So I'll hand over to, to Steve very shortly. And um, if you haven't done an IC webinar before, I'll just give you a bit of an idea around the format. So on the tool that you use, on the tool that we use, you'll see there's the opportunity to ask questions. So because we get so many people on these webinars now, actually we have you all on mute, um, but we would love to get your questions. There'll be time to ask to, um, Steve to cover those questions at the end. So if you can populate your um, any questions you have as we go along, um, I'll keep an eye on those, I'll, I'll moderate them, and then I'll feed those back into Steve at the end. So please do, please ask any questions that you've got and we'll pick those up at the end. Um, as with all our webinars, it automatically records, so you will re re receive a recording of the webinar via email um, later on this afternoon, so you can revisit. And also if you want to share it um, with other people in your organisation, and um, we will also put that recording onto our website where you can also go and see the archive of all the, the, the previous webinars we've been, we've been holding. Um, but that's enough for me. Um, I'm really interested in this webinar. Um, I, I, if you don't know Universum, um, really a strong organisation, very um, very strong global presence, really know, know, know this stuff when it comes to um, um, the whole marketing and attraction world, but I'll, I'll let Steve give a, give a full introduction. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Steve, Steve Ward, who's UK and Ireland Director at Universum. Steve. Afternoon, Stephen. Thank you very much for your uh, invite me to do this. Um, this is superb. Thanks everyone for taking part and joining this. Um, what I'm going to walk through today, um, as sort of alluded to on the front there, um, is is a little bit of a journey that we've gone through, if you like, over these last couple of months. I mean, obviously, uh, things may have changed a little bit in, uh, in our business lives in the last couple of uh, few weeks. And um, and as a global organization, as Universum is, we've seen that from the start. We've seen that from um, from China and from, um, from the, the East, where we have quite a, a big presence with some global organizations. And, and therefore, as an organization, we sort of had to react um, a little bit before it probably reached most of us in, in mainland Europe. And, and so, um, and a lot of that comes around the fact of um, a lot of our work is around student engagement um, and marketing and communication student engagement. So, so, and so this will talk through a little bit of a journey we've gone on um, around helping um, organizations adapt their campus recruitment and student engagement uh, capabilities through some of the solutions and data that we op operate around. So just as a, um, as a first intro, um, well, what I'll do is I'll cover who are Universum, a little bit about the projects that I want to talk through with you that we that we solved and have now started to roll out to other organisations, and the sort of approach that that is that's taken, um, and the sort of how long it takes bit as well, basically to kind of give a bit of an idea as to what a digital and virtual program looks like if we're thinking about evolving some of our methodology to augment our university work with some digital uh, work as well, and, and how we work with universities to do that. Um, a little bit of Universum at a glance. Um, so we've been around for a long time. We're over 30 years old. Um, traditionally, um, student data and research around brand opinion, about career choices and and um, feelings of, of a generation um, that you tends to sit between sort of 16 and 21 years old um, are, have been the benchmark of what we've done for 30 years. Um, we do that around the world. We're we we're present in over um, over 20 countries in the world as an organization, and we survey students and professionals from over 40 countries um, in the world. So, um, so yeah, very, very wide reach um, of our data sources. So it allows us to be able to blend all sorts of depth and avenues and, and con contrasts and, and the like around people and the different uh, learning disciplines around the world and different geographies around the world, as well as looking at local market presence as well. So obviously that makes us a strong choice to support 
uh, large global organizations but of course having so much local knowledge also helps us um, direct that towards local markets so there's a number of things there that we, we we're involved in things like employer branding academy where we train people in employer branding strategy uh, the career test is the survey that we send out to uh, university students every year and also uh, mirror that now to professional students uh, we have over 2,000 clients around the world so yeah we know what we're doing we've been around this uh, block for quite a long time I think it's fair to say what I want to I'm just going to quickly walk through the method in which we communicate um, to students and ask an opinion the reason for this is because this this forge is very um, particularly into the way in which we go about this virtual campus engagement kind of progress because it's the method of the data collection and the way in which we understand the insights from those data that allows us to be able to drive very targeted customer communications or sorry, talent communications to those audiences. So, so we go through a journey with a whole bunch of things we ask in the career test, but one of those things when we're trying to identify what ideal employers are, organizations that students feel are attractive organizations, what we do is we go through a journey of asking, we'll, we'll, for their geographical location, we'll give them a list of leading and, and SME and, and medium-sized employers. Usually it's the larger ones because of course they are the most recognized ones, so it's large and medium-sized organizations. And we'll ask, and in the survey, the students will be asked to tick the ones that they're familiar with as organizations. So it tends to be quite high that those we tend to get quite a lot of people will recognize an organization to start with. So we and what we're trying to do here is mirror a pseudo-attraction funnel in relation to talent attraction marketing. Um, so that awareness piece will be, do you recognize them? Yes, we do. Great. Then the next stage of that is we'll say, okay, of those companies you just recognized and you've uh, identified as companies that you know who they are, uh, either by the brand or whatever, um, which of those do you feel are an employee that you would consider working for? Um, and so they'll then from that list or then tick a few of those and they go, yeah, okay, this is a company I'm interested in working in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then that draws the drift list down a little bit closer and says, of these people that are left, which could be 20, 25, 30, however many it is, which of those would you apply for a job for today? So if there was a job there for you right now in your area, would you, which of the five that you would choose first um, to apply for? And they'll choose those five. And those five make the benchmark um, for the ideal employers report that we do every year, which turns into the university's most uh, attractive employer um, awards, which we, we deliver every year on a global and local basis. This year, that will be happening in June because we've just collected the 2020 data and we'll be sharing it to UK companies over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, so that builds a, a path as to who are the most, of all the organisations, who are the most attractive ones, which ones would you consider working for? And, uh, and, and in and around that, we, all, we ask all sorts of questions around why? What attributes do you see in an organization that you think is why it's attractive? And, and, and rate the, all of those things, 40 attributes from one to five, so that people weight their interest towards an organization by specific factors around their brand, the way they carry themselves, their employer brand, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that gives us, not only does it give us our ideal employer list, but it also gives us some of the drivers as to why an individual has chosen a certain company and vice versa, why an individual has not chosen a certain com company. So that journey is giving us huge amounts of data points as to why com certain companies are chosen, why certain companies are not, why certain people in certain fields of study choose a certain set of values and things that they're looking for from their career, and why other students from certain other um, fields of study choose different routes and, and the, the granularity of the, the data means that you can we can really drill into to real necessity to for example why tech graduates look for xyz inside their next organization but that next organization shouldn't be something like this but it will be more like this etc and that helps us design programs that they're able to communicate to um, to talent better um, so from a mass scale one million students globally um, in fact, I think it's probably going to be about 1.2 million globally. I think we'll be going to be uh, closing when we close our 2020 uh, research in the next few weeks. Um, 
And 40,000 of those in the UK, we've just cleaned the data. I think it started at about 47,000. I think we're cleaning, cleaning it down to around 41,000 um, UK students. Plus as well, we're collecting what will be about 30,000 early careers professionals as well. People who have moved in to their career and are between two and eight years into their career. Um, the reason we do that and have spent some time over recent years doing that is it's, uh, the fascinating contrast between somebody who is preparing for employment versus those who have now been into employment. Often the data is the same set of people and some differences uh, that we took from, from our student hub. So um, so it really loads and loads and loads and loads of data, loads and millions of data points that we, we, we play around with and have all sorts of uh, geeky fun with in order to help organizations uh, attract talent better. Um, just from a methodology as to what that kind of means. So from completing the circle of what Universum ultimately does, all that by understanding all that um, external data, the understanding of internal data, the understanding of preferences, the understanding of competitor insights, because of course we can compare uh, apples for apples when we um, when we look at different organisations. From that, we build EVPs and employer branding programs, and we identify the things that are very distinct about an organisation to help them uh, communicate better to audiences that have some sort of relevant um, affinity with the, with uh, with the brand and with other brands potentially like it and um, how we build audiences from that. So um, so that's the journey of who Universum is. Thank you for indulging me with that, but it'll, but it'll make sense as we walk through um, the process of the journey we went on, on with our first example of a virtual campus project. So, so the background, um, this this customer, which unfortunately, sorry, we'd, we'd probably be about a day away from um, legitimately being able to say who the customer is. So I really apologize that uh, on this particular day, we weren't able to mention who the customer is because they haven't signed the paperwork to say that we can share um, them and their story, just more so the, the, the work that we did with them. Um, so the, um, you no, know, uh, uh, well, obviously when this all came about, um, it, it instantly affected this organization's ability to, and and desire to continue to engage with students in a way that they already had before. Yes, they do all sorts of applications, social media routes and, and other methods of engaging with the audience, but their plans to engage with universities um, and create physical environments to engage with students was of course completely quashed um, in key markets for them. And in, in, this was particularly, like I say, this came from APAC to start with. And um, so we're talking about places like Singapore, um, Argent, uh, Australia and China, uh, places where this organization would take a lot of its talent uh, from from students from your, from universities, um, the company uh, had a very specific focus. It was looking at uh, engineering talent, and it was looking and actually it wanted to achieve its um, its target goals, its DNI goals. Uh, and uh, rather like many engineering organisations, they were struggling in a DNI perspective and gender balance, particularly perspective, and wanted to be very very targeted around who they engaged their um, graduate programs during during 2020. So they um, so they asked us to um, so based on the uh, the work that they'd already been doing, there's obviously some engagement the customers got, but they wanted to work out how do we make it more targeted and how do we build a way of engaging with these people in some kind of human to human basis rather than purely being through the social media and maybe kind of um, applications and things you know but, you know old fashioned kind of style stuff. How they wanted to embrace kind of new technology and our capability to do that. So um, so what we did is we used a methodology that's very, very widely and commonly used in marketing. We use it almost with every customer we, we work on with, in relation to um, into attracting uh, audiences through social media and engagement. We used what's called the lookalike audiences uh, methodology. Now, this is this is a marketing methodology that is um, it could be adopted in, in platforms such as Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and other regional ones from around the world like um, WeChat and, and the like. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and using and this is a methodology where if you if you want to do Facebook advertising through Facebook for business, you can pop your advert in that you want to put in. You say, right, these are the parameters. We want to attract female. We want to attract people who live in this location. We want people who have got an interest in this and who are in a 
uh, a subset of this. And so you set the kind of the sort of basic parameters as to what it is you want to achieve from the audience when you put out a pay-per-click uh, campaign or a, a paid ads campaign on Facebook or Google or any of these sort of things, basically. And it gives you a, a nice comeback. It's, it's a very successful methodology now because the um, it, it works very well, uh, much better than maybe it did four or five years ago. It's, it's a very proven, provenly successful marketing format. So they wanted to use some of that, that which is which we're already doing some work with them on on that kind of stuff generally. But what we looked at with this is we want to attract for this organisation a particular talent type, a particular engin female engineering students who are graduating in this particular period and equally but we wanted to do it better and, and again our method the universal methodology of doing this is done better because those that source audience um, that we, we create a source audience so we, rather than using the parameters function on Facebook what we're saying is right from a source audience Facebook and all of these things have got a very clever methodology that I won't go into the deep details of but can identify people who are very very similar to people from the source audience. Now, where does the source audience come from? Well, the source audience is technology and engineering graduates who are female, although we didn't specify that particularly, but obviously we wanted to try and um, in the content attract more female, but technology people who had an interest in this organization, who chose this organization as their preferred employer, who followed the university choices that the company wanted to choose university choices from. And, and so what it's taking as a source parameters, not basic parameters, but what it's actually doing is saying these individuals and what it's effectively doing is creating DNA examples of a almost like a most highly relevant candidate who has an interest in the organization. And then using the lookalike methodology that's used in these social platforms and through their advertising methodologies, they Facebook and Google and the likes creates automatically creates lookalike audiences. People, so if you've got this source audience of these people by their individual status, we recognize that here are another uh, 5,000 people who look who are very similar to them in regards to their education type, their interests, their preferences, what they read, what they care about, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that creates this multiplication process that means that off that very source data, we can advertise and market to a large audience based on those kind of characteristics that would make this an ideal group set of, infant, of, um, of audience uh, for this particular organization. That journey will be different for every organization because the source audience will be different. Apologies. Um, the source audience is different because every organization has different fans and different levels of attraction amongst student audiences. And those student audiences have different motivators depending on where they are, what, what degree it is they did, and what their goals are for their career moving forward. So we're really drilling it down to a smallish data set to be able to create a large data set. And so, so we run that, um, so we ran that program. Um, so that we started to then create um, target audiences, emphasis on source audiences, because uh, anybody can do Facebook marketing, of course, it's, it's, it's achievable, but this improves the, um, the relevance by six or seven times. So, um, so therefore it creates a better and higher quality audience. So the journey was from that. So what do we, so what do, what do we tell these people? Once we've created the source audience, what do we tell them and, and the lookalike audience? What are we gonna, what are we gonna uh, send to them? Well, we ran a campaign, um, again, comes back from universe and data, find the source audience, and then run campaigns for content that we know one represents the organization super well, but of course the other element that we've got uh, from the data is the fact that we know the, the preferences and drivers of that source audience. What are the hooks? What are the things that they care about, that they are looking for in an organization that is an engineering and in this particular sector and in this particular location? We can drill into what the preferences are and what the data tells us the preferences are, and therefore we can create content with the, with the organization to align to those drivers, to make sure that we're touching the right words, we're speaking the right things and, and, and mirroring the kind of language that they're looking for in their next organization, so long as it marries up also with what is true about the organization as well. So what we're trying to do is make sure that what's attractive about the organization, what's true about the organization and what people want, those three things are aligned, 
do that like a Venn diagram and in a little sweet spot in the middle is what our employer branding message is all about. And uh, and so we run these campaigns through like say we're, for this particular one, we use social media campaigns, we use Google ads as well, um, et cetera. And there was an email marketing campaign to support it as well. So number of touch points to be able to engage with um, specific student uh, groups based on their own audience and the audience we were building for them. Um, on the day, this is uh, uh, the, the, the scenario was simple, almost like what we see here right now. I mean, because uh, we started using GoToWebinar as the first format um, for this for these um, campus uh, engagements, because what we're directing people towards is a webinar. Um, so in the replacing the fact that they can't sit down inside universities in front of students who are walking by as part of the campus days, what they then had to consider is what are we going to put in the webinar? So we're going to have a webinar, we're going to have a dedicated 60 minutes or it might be 90 minutes or two hours, whatever they feel is the right uh, time. 60 minutes is the recommended one that has with all things around webinars. And it's an opportunity. And the great opportunity for the organization here was it's not it's not just a casual conversation they're now having. Actually, what they can do is really present themselves in the most um, crisp and clean way in a branded webinar that's self-branded for them um, and they can they can share videos they can share stories they can get snippets of, uh, from the CEO they can um, they can um, they can walk through what onboarding looks like what the opportunities are so what they can do is a very structured presentation of their organization to a group of students who have signed up for the webinar uh, just like you guys will have done uh, to sign up for this webinar, uh, the same will have applied, albeit it would have come through different methods of marketing and, 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 um, and advertising relevant to those people through Facebook, Instagram, Google, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the, again, and that also comes back to whatever the appropriate channels are for the audience we're targeting, uh, equally important, naturally, needless to say. So the, 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 uh, the organization hosts this, the students attend at the set times, um, and then, the system is run and so so the journey um, this in this example they chose four cities so they did four webinars for four cities uh, the benefit of doing that is in two or three ways really one certainly to have multiple days um, having multiple webinars it means that if somebody couldn't attend their chosen city one it meant it has an opportunity for them to to join another city one if they um, if they if they wanted to of course these could they could have chosen four fields of study they could have chosen uh, for timelines, whatever it is, you know, there's a number of reasons of why it may, it may choose more than one or more than two webinars to be able to do, conduct this. So, so they um, uh, obviously everything around the engagement is customized and branded for them to make sure that they um, they they are it's clean and communicative through the process and brand strong. Um, obviously, then they. they manage the registration list, they can do emails in preparation for it, give them people some things to read beforehand, etc, etc. So the whole run is um, is just as if you're running a webinar, but of course you're doing it to your to your audience. We help in the background, we do a lot of the um, the background stuff, you know, if we want us to, we manage the questions uh, and all of that kind of stuff in, in the background and make sure that the thing is working okay and everything is, um, is supported. So that's just our bit on the day, as having done all the marketing stuff, we kind of, we know the technology. In fact, we've just moved to a different platform called On24 to do these now because it's a slightly more dynamic platform, but we, we, we give people our kind of platform because, um, it's the to use because it's the most dynamic uh, one and available to do it um, to make it better branded and better presented to the audience basically um, and uh, yeah as I alluded to we look after all the bits and pieces on the day I don't need to go into that too much but certainly um, certainly make sure that the, as an organization they didn't have to worry about the mechanics of all of this all they just needed to do was make sure that they tell their best be their best selves uh, and tell their best story to um, to the to students in the room um, on that particular uh, webinar day um, and of course we support you know the good thing about doing webinar um, uh, webinars is the fact that also you there are performance reports and analytics that look at the kind of numbers in relation to engagement how long do people stay on for um, we can look at how many questions who asked questions who didn't um, it will hold questions for you afterwards so if you know you've probably dealt with questions on the day but of course if there was 
uh, on the report that you get afterwards, it will show you the questions that individuals answered. So, so when you look at the attendee list afterwards and try and get a feel as to the kind of people who engage with it and therefore and what their level of engagement was like, um, you can do that. So you start to create some individuals, uh, some personas out of the individuals that you started to um, to engage and um, and really be able to analyze it subsequently as a consequence of course you can do things like running polls so if you want to keep it maybe maybe slightly fun and interactive at the same time you can do polls and surveys and all this kind of stuff as well so all sorts of goodness you can do with this that that gives us sort of another dynamic to the way in which we engage students for the first time and um, when we're normally so used to doing it in other ways so so really um, interesting opportunities that it presents uh, through that a typical timeline, well, I'd say typical timeline. This is the timeline that, that, that worked for this organization. Um, this was done, and I mean, everything was done inside three weeks. Uh, that's from the first concept um, going out on advertising and going out through the advertising routes to the sign ups to the operation of the webinars. They ran the four webinars over the course of uh, a one week period uh, for the different uh, audiences over the course of two weeks actually but broken down into one uh week and it was and then it was done and and we uh, and, and as a program we we think three to four weeks is probably the perfect kind of timeline for it they just wanted to react fast because they were felt as though they were falling behind their work as a consequence of the, of the pandemic and and the outcome of that and, and so they so it demonstrates how quick somebody some, something can be done from nothing to something in relation to creation of content or choice of content, creation of an audience, using the data to create a very relevant audience, and then delivering uh, a webinars off the back of it. And from a time-saving point of view, it's superb because, of course, there's a lot less traveling around the country uh, doing it. It's, it's something they were able to do there and then right in front of them um, at their desks um with all sorts of engagements as well and um, and that creates a, a very different and alternate dynamic um to that actually paints a very positive picture of an organization a very very good question i was asked when uh, we we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago on this subject and um and one of my colleagues asked me does this replace university campus uh engagement and and the, the answer to that question is is clearly no because i think there's one of the as i think you all know on the who are on this webinar and certainly uh, customers that we talk to know campus engagement is still the most is the is the most productive form of student engagement and uh, through the process uh, that's been proven by a number of my customers that, that we're working with in the uk um, so it doesn't it's not about replacing one thing for another but it's looking about how do we involve stu evolve student engagement and whilst this is indeed replacing uh, campus recruitment in the event of the absence of campus recruitment uh, the absence of campus uh, careers days and the like what it's giving the opportunity to do is to allow organizations to engage with talent in a digital way in a way that actually is probably more optimized for certain groups of talent some people are not as good face to face not comfortable in environments with, where other people are around where they have to do face to face engagement for some of people this is their perfect way of engaging it's the it's when they come to life and when they become the most engaged and particularly from a from a from a diversity and inclusion perspective it's providing multiple methods of engaging with the organization is smart and it's right and the way to do it so so it certainly paints a very positive picture of the organization it certainly did in this case because it created a, a, a feeling of an organization that is pivoting the way in which they do things and adapting to digital methodologies of communication and that that's a smart 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 move right now the results of this particular program for four webinars they had 353 people sign up for it and of those people that signed up 242 people uh, attended the webinar so so off the bat off this they were able to create an engaged audience of 240 uh, attendees the engagement percentage so what I mean by the engagement percentage is the people who were highly engaged and asked questions during the webinar was over 60 percent so we had so so the choice the 242 people that have attended the webinars have chosen the organization they haven't just walked by them and in a, in a random career fair They've chosen to spend time with this organization, have put an hour of their time aside to do so. So 
and because what they saw in advertising and in marketing was something that appealed to them. Now we know that we've you know that we've we've used data to make sure that happens as much as possible. And then when we're getting them in the um, in the program and on the webinars, they're engaging because they're interested as well. Um, from a reverse perspective, they fitted they fit the target audiences that we were looking for in the first place. You know, when we did that source audience, it came from what the organization needs as well as what the students need. So we're, we're talking about people who fit the mold of the kind of uh, attributes that the organization needs in a, in a student. Or, so, we, so we get the chemistry correct. So this is 242 highly engaged chemistry um, astute um people so um who are attending this audit and and look, numbers like this are kind of relative somebody might look at that and go that's too many some people might look at it and go hey look i was expecting like a thousand um but the point is this is about targeted marketing and very very specific audiences and i think actually if we walk away from the four cities with 20, 240 very active uh well 20, 242 active but about if we're talking about the 60 something percent kind of area then you're probably talking about um uh, you're going to get test my maths here but something in the region of 150 to 160 highly engaged students which was perfect uh, which is why the customer was super happy this was a great pilot exercise and allowed us therefore the opportunity to go right this is something we can do it and we can do it again and so that's what uh, we now do as a solution so that's our sort of methodology that we've we've adopted to kind of evolve uh, this change in which we've seen um, in the way that we're working but i think as we all know as the, the future of work is accelerating a little bit in these recent weeks um, as we're all adopting more digital methodologies than we ever have before uh, i think our willingness to adopt uh, and, and evolve into more video webinar digital engagement and virtual engagement technology and uh, and relationships um, we are broadening our thinking as a consequence of doing and probably broadening our reach at the same time so so that's the program we went through i hope that is super interesting um and fascinating and, and maybe a little bit scary for some people as well which is perfectly fine because i think all new things are um are scary i know that organizations are certainly embracing um webinar uh, and video technology to do one-to-one -one engagement and and the like but i think this was an opportunity to maybe think about how do we present ourselves to multiple people and targeted people at that so um so that's a run through that uh, i guess back to you stephen in relation to any questions or thoughts that uh, you or everybody else might have Thank you very much, Steve. I will give you a virtual round of applause as if this is one of our face-to-face -face, um, events. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, to those of you on the on the webinar, um, if you've got any questions, please do pop them in the in the question box. And um, we've had one through already from from Charlie. So Charlie's asking if you have any sense from your clients yet whether they still want to attend on-campus careers fairs come the autumn, or are our virtual fairs going to be the way forward? I think that's a question that's on a lot of people's lips at the moment. Yeah, I think I think it's a really great question because I think it's I think the I I, I had uh, I presented this to and when we just did a webinar we had quite a number of um, university contacts very almost a little bit worried about it as we walked through the, the journey and said hang on where's the but actually no the, the idea behind it in fact we did when we did this for this organisation we partnered with their chosen universities to to work to um to what were the best methodologies and blah blah and what did they know about the students so what we're bringing together is all the people involved i don't think we're looking at how we replace um um all other methodology i think it's about how you create greater choice and augment what you already do uh, i think as and maybe that question might have come in before i probably alluded to that uh, uh sort of an answer around it about five minutes ago which was around the fact that i think it just is a demonstration of of the opportunities of communication we have i think we all know we're all adapting to marketing communication in the way that we engage with students there are many many uh, funnels of approach to to access our students this really is creating a just another funnel and a very refined funnel uh, but i don't think it should replace anything i think it should augment it and i think we should be working with our universities our preferred universities to work out how do we partner with each other to create engaged student audiences through this program and, and, and work as partnership through this that's how we've seen it work so far let's put it that way and and these examples are definitely, this company definitely wasn't wanting to replace um, they just had no choice uh this year because of the um 
because of the virus and they closed down they shut down cool thanks yes yeah, it's, it's interesting because um we things i alluded to at the start of this webinar we're we're starting to hear the conversation so we're getting the question asked for us around yeah. the autumn and and i think people are starting to ask the question whether it's from a university point of view, wondering you know, how to go about planning for the autumn, what to organize, yeah. or from employers trying to work out, well, what do we want to do? I think the reality yeah. is we're at a stage now, we're still so early into this, and there's so many uncertainties about, I think there's two things at play. One is actually what will we be allowed to do in terms of actually movement and, and the numbers of people we can gather. But I think there's another perspective on this, which is, it's not also what we're allowed to do, it's what appetite will universities, employers yeah. and students have, because some yeah. employers are very risk averse with this and they won't want to send their people um, you know, out and about, and there'll also be budget constraints. So I think it's it's I think it's too early to tell, but it's something that a conversation we want to make sure happens, you know, over the over the coming weeks. Yeah. But I think it's too early at the moment. It is, and, and equally at the time, although uh, too early, but I think, I think one of the things that this, you know, a, a couple of relevant conversations that we've had around this with um, with customers right now is the fact that actually this is, you know, this means that they can do something ahead of the competition. I think one of the things that they thought about with some of this is how do we start to engage talent? You know, again, we think about all the tactics, if you like, good phrase, but uh, it's probably true about how do we get ahead in, in university engagement? Um, we've been and, and every organization has been looking at that for, for years now as to what do we do? How do we get there first? How do we win over our opportunity? And I think one of the, conversa the conversations that we're having in the UK as we've, you know, we brought this to the table and started to adopt it is, is very much around what can we do now to gay students whilst we can't do anything else or we're limited on the opportunities to do anything else. And that's where adoption and interest has come in right now is because we can start to build an audience and start to engage an audience. And that tends to um, tends to come from organisations that have thought very, very carefully and maybe already done the job of stepping back a little bit over these last two or three weeks and go, right, OK, things have changed. We need a plan B and a plan C, etc. And what are the plan Bs and plan Cs that we need to do? Well, one of the things we need to do is we need to build some sort of community around our student engagement and and support and give them reassurance during the course of this time i was reading a report that uh, milk round produced uh, a couple of days ago um our partner company in the stepstone group milk round um produced a report that looked at and students are worried um uh, there's a lot of worry uh, from students in relation to whether the career is still there for them next year um uh, whether i think something like 57 percent of uh, people who had internships set up have been cancelled uh, so there's a lot of worry uh, in the student community as well. So we need to think about how do we build our student communities and how do we engage them to make sure as organizations we're showing that we're working with them and we're pivoting and we're moving and we're not sure, but we're trying to do all the things we can to make sure that we've got some avenues. And this is a way of, I guess, engage and that's something that comes from the conversations i've been having right now if that makes sense it's um it's a, there's a little bit of prep i think a lot of people are doing a lot of preparation work right now um in this time where we're all sat behind our computers um on yes Zoom and a lot, of, a lot of yeah a lot of contingency planning planning i think very much so. yeah, got another couple of questions here steve and i think you can probably wrap these two into one actually so this is from helen and leo um so asking around um, Helen was asking, how difficult is it to set up a targeted webinar? Sort of, I, I know you covered the the how long bits, but I wanted to forget yeah. more around actually just how difficult it is. Can you use the same templates? And then I think this is a related question from Leo, who was asking, kind of what are the what are the concerns that em, that employers are usually expressing when it comes to actually um, delivering online content? So how difficult yeah. it is, and what are the, what are the concerns that employers are expressing? Yeah, yeah. So the difficulty bit is. Um, is not terribly difficult as long as um, the time and care is put into doing it. The legwork part, it, look, I mean, that's that's universal skill. So, you know, the elements about building source audiences, using data and mark and building marketing programs to, to support that. Look, that's that's our domain. And, and the, the, you know, in this example here, the company offloaded that to us. And obviously we just consulted with them through the process and what and try and make sure that you know, when we set up the communication, does it mirror 
what the EVP of the organization speaks of and the brand of the communication and what they're trying to achieve and what the audience is looking for. So, so you know, the, the complexity part is our skill set. Uh, the technology part um, is not terribly difficult. I think I think we will probably both allude to that, uh, Stephen, as we, we both run webinars reasonably often. And I think building a webinar is not difficult. I think building the program of what you want to put in the webinar um, is the one that takes a little bit of time and thought. But again, um, once you've done it, um, you can repeat it um, or or assess it afterwards or and adjust it. So so once you've built yourself a bit of a template, you can you can rerun it, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So so I would say it's not what I don't think it's difficult, but I think we all know that it takes a little bit of uh, care and time. Um, but the exp you know the super expertise, techie marketing bit, that's our domain. Nobody needs to worry about that so much. It's more about making sure that you choose the right people to present and what you want inside that webinar. We help you with that, of course, but at the same time, it's uh, it's that has to be driven by what you want to show. Um, the content piece, uh, I, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, or or could you just repeat it again, Stephen, just so I can make sure I answer it correctly, the second question around sure. concerns. Sure. Yeah, I think it's just concerns around um, what are the concerns that employers express about delivering online content? So what would your typical employer client say, you know, Yes, yeah. here's what we're doing online. You know, what, what should we be worried about, or what are they worried about, whether you know, rightfully or, or not rightfully worried about? Yeah, I think actually the uh, probably the companies who are uh, who who adopt this are probably not less in the worried category, and I think they're pr pr companies I think who feel reasonably confident about their um, their ability to drive some to deliver some content will will walk into this quite comfortably and go great it's a platform for doing this great we're superb we go with it i think the the where certain worries will, would come in is do we attract are we getting the right people in the room um so again attendee management before the webinar and attendee management afterwards um is really important to make sure that if there's some of the things that they're talking through in the webinar are you don't want them widely available. You don't want them in other sources, etc. Look, these these webinars are closed. They're locked webinars for attendee only, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that really isn't the challenge. I think there is. Um, if there was any other reticence, it would be around. Okay, does uh, digital advertising work? I think uh, and I, that would be a very understandable one. I'm a, I'm a very late, despite being involved in marketing for 40, 15 plus years. I'm quite a late adopter to the idea of digital. Uh, paid advertising and um, and that methodology uh, and uh, with a good reason because it used to be terrible um, and it's now very very good and tailored and marketed and I think we're all aware I don't know what, I don't know about anybody else on the call but I'm very very uh, I am a bit of a sucker and if I see something that's very very good um, that's well tailored to me in advertising um, I'm quite happy particularly right now by the way because I can't go to a shop so if somebody wants to sell me something um, that I that they know that I need um, digitally at the moment, the chances are I am going to click and, and potentially buy because um, because it's the only route to, uh, <laughs> to, the, to the shops at the minute. But the point is, it's a very common thing now. We're actually the, our, our Generation um, Z and Generation Y audiences are very, very um, attuned to their digital existence and, and online engagement now and so therefore it's a very relevant uh, method of communication to those people so so i think i hope that covers some of the concern things i think they're probably the things that would concern people the most i think delivering the webinar is less of a concern i think it's just more about the asset and, and the methods of, of of gaining an audience that probably um more uh, create reticence because of um of lack of awareness and lack of uh, experience of doing it before Oh, thanks, Steve. Yes, and uh, Leah said thanks for answering this, this question on that. Um, um, coming from Lucy, actually, rather than a question, so Lucy also makes the point about talking to universities. You mentioned um, working with universities, Steve, and actually in, in universities have experience about dealing with um, um, virtual tools and have a range of virtual tools for yeah. interacting interacting with, with students, so I think it's, it's definitely worth remembering. Um, a slightly related subject, but um, our webinar, not tomorrow, but the day after, is actually from the University of York. You've been delivering virtual insight programs for the last three years, and they're going to be talking about how they do um, how they do that. So I think there's some learnings on that. So I really would yeah. recommend employers to be talking to universities as well, because a lot of this virtual stuff, they've either been doing it or they're having to adapt to it very, very, very quickly. Yeah, and I just got no. Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry, go on. Oh no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. I've got another question. So. 
Yeah, go for it. Go for, go for the question. That's good. Okay, cool. Okay. So, um, so another question here from from Lisa. So she's interested to know from your perspective if if a virtual networking event is something that 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 an employer should do, and and if there's there any sort of suggestions on hosting those networking sessions online. I think that's a very personal choice. One, I, 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 to me, the thought of it sounds a little chaotic um and i'm wondering whether how effective it would be as a brand exercise if you sort of mean i think it would be i think it would be fun and i think if you created an environment where it is a fun and almost mirrors because i guess if we're creating things like virtual networking really what therefore we're doing is almost creating almost like a zoom environment or a or a, a mutual and, and and that could be quite chaotic the other way of doing it um, is to almost treat it um, rather than it being an everybody involved, everybody's mic on, or that kind of thing. You could absolutely do use uh, methods like this and your own methods that don't involve this to think about how do you engage. You know, I, I alluded at, at about sort of five minutes ago to sort of community engagement and thinking about how do you think about different ways of engaging a student community and building rapport with your brand. That's a different out, that's a different subject because I think, because then all of a sudden you can start thinking about, all right, so how, why don't we do fireside chats with, um, with the CEO or with somebody inside the organization or a graduate and join the company three years ago and, and, and can tell the story of the, um, and then you could invite people to, uh, to ask questions verbally or whatever, or however you wanted to do it. Um, so I think there are different ways in which we could use these sort of formats to engage talent and keep them in, um, interested and tell stories about the organization, almost from a, not necessarily from a hiring journey perspective, but more from just a kind of a community engagement piece. That would be my suggestion. I think the networking, I, it depends what you meant by networking, but I think the thought of kind of getting 20 people on a Zoom call or something like that, um might be a bit chaotic and may not leave an amazing brand impression I, I don't know whether anybody else has had any experience that of seeing something like that i haven't so i can't necessarily say that i've seen a great example of it so um I, it just sounds a little chaotic to me yeah so we've not seen any examples yet so if anybody on the webinar has um or knows any practice please let us know maybe that's something that that we can showcase um, I wonder if um, sort of rooms within Zoom might be something that people can use so you can get groups into smaller numbers and maybe some more one to one type conversations or one to small numbers might, might be the, the, um, yeah, the way and forward. And some of these platforms, so there's another platform called Crowdcast, I think it can be done with on 24, there are, where you can almost create days with multiple channels as well. So you can create, yeah, a bit like you're alluding to, you can have individual Zooms or you can have. Um, uh, little places yeah where you kind of you you host in one place but then everybody breaks off into three different channels um to follow down a certain thing to follow down another angle to follow around different where it's subject orientated or whatever else it might be so are definitely you know all of these or all, all of these um technologies now are developing all sorts of um, evolutions to their existence and their capabilities we've all seen zoom evolve over the last month and the backgrounds adding different pictures and all of these sort of things and all sorts of things are now being added some of them are adding games and so there's all sorts of things that are being involved and so i imagine there's some very very good avenues to do yeah different kind of um party orientated kind of environments but with different kind of different rooms different channels as you alluded to Stephen. Yeah, I think we have lots of um, yeah, lots of innovation happening. Um, um, we're pretty much up for time, but I was just um, um, oh, sorry, I've just got a comment here. I'm just looking at my screen. Um, so um, somebody has made a comment saying it works very well in breakout rooms. Students have enjoyed talking to hosts in this format within Zoom. So um, that's from Natalie Natalie Cartwright. Okay. So she's seen seen that work. So um, so yeah, please get in touch, Natalie, if you want to talk about that to us a, a little bit more. And um, just to wrap up, Steve. Um, just before just before we finish um mm -hmm. one of the things we were talking about just before everybody came online was obviously um a lot of your organizations were is in china hong kong singapore mm -hmm. um and of course in this particular case i think this is why it was really useful because it's it's an organization in those territories and yeah. it's actually you know sort of further ahead in this pandemic situation than, than we are is there anything you're hearing from from your sort of your teams over in those countries are they restarting is it is it kind of um fragmented because i think that might give us a little bit of a roadmap for how things might play out yeah. here yeah so we um i say we're very fortunate to have offices over in the in 
the APAC are, uh, are fortunate for the fact it is giving us a little bit of an insight as to uh, not the post, it's not, I don't think we're, we've got such a thing as a post pandemic scenario, but certainly um, people who are on the other side of the curve. And, um, and uh, we have seen over the last two, three weeks the change back to a certain degree of normality. I think, obviously, I don't think nor what we know as normal will be anything like um, normal for quite a long time yet. I think we're in a new normal scenario, but, but I think China went back to work um, um, two or three weeks ago with uh, a great amount of care and a great amount of um, discipline, uh, shall we say, I think, um, and therefore with a degree of confidence. I think we've seen some reports, uh, I think I've certainly heard some reports from some global organizations that say that, um, that there's story of a potential second wind of the virus hitting certain parts of China. Um, uh, but again, China is such a vast or, um, country, it's very, very difficult to pin on China. But from a business perspective, certainly, we've seen things go pretty much back to normal um, I, I, on our, our Facebook workplace um, uh, channel. We've had our China team uh, talking about their meetings with customers and sat inside customers and sitting networking. You know, there are there are some normality happening, but you know, with China, a lot with masks on and lots of protective measures and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, it's, it seems it seems they're certainly breaking through. I think they're giving us hope. Let's put it that way, Stephen. I think they're giving us hope that there is another way around this. I think all their economies and, and social environments are different to ours, but I think at the same, and it's different from Singapore to China. But I think we're certainly seeing. Uh, more positive news coming out of there that should give us some kind of uh, room for optimism um, uh, moving forward in these next kind of let's say month or so. So, um, so fingers crossed we fall along the same plan as them. Um, but I think as long as we do it in a very uh, responsible way, in a very careful way, I think um, like China seem to be doing, then uh, I think um, then we can hope to hopefully have all these uh, university visits and the like back again in September, October. Let's hope so. That's for sure. Uh, that was great, Steve, and, and thanks for a really informative webinar. That's been very, been very interesting. Thank I think you. we're going to be doing quite a bit more in this space um, over the coming weeks. As this is, is, is yes, yeah. as we kind of obviously we're in a lot of crisis management mode at the moment, but we're going to have to start thinking about transitions into into what what may be the same or what may be different in the future. I think that whole yeah. attraction and marketing piece, this debate is um, is um, it's going to be quite a lively one over the over the over the next few weeks. So, Steve, thanks again. Really informative. Thanks to everybody for taking part. Thanks to everybody who posed their questions. Um, we had well over 100 people um, again engaging on this this webinar. Um, so, as I said at the start, you will get a recording from it. And um, if you want to share that, please do. We'll also put it on our website. And um, please keep um, tuning into our webinars. We've got one tomorrow, which is about. Um, development, how you actually develop into your student hires once they join. And again, um, Josh from DBL, who will be using some of his experiences from their clients in Asia Pack. Um, Thursday, as I've already mentioned, webinar is about um, online virtual internships. And, um, and Andrew from York's got some case studies of employers he's worked with where they've done real internships online where the interns have actually paid and done done meaningful work um, for those employers so i think there'll be some some good learning there and then we've got more and more coming down the line I'll, i won't um i won't go through the whole list now because i'm sure we have um, busy very busy days to get on with so thanks for everybody for taking part and talk to you all soon and please stay safe everybody have enjoy the rest of the day